we find spirals in many aspects of life. Most notably, spirals are often found in nature. They have fascinated artists, biologists and mathematicians for thousands of years, but they're an equally prominent form found in many pieces of sculpture and architecture. Typically, we see architecture and sculpture as being two very different mediums, but for thousands of years, these two seemingly contrasting disciplines have been intertwined. However, recently, the relationship between architecture and sculpture is growing ever closer. With the advent of new technologies and processes, buildings can now become sculptural art forms in their own right, rather than simply buildings adorned with sculptures on them. We tend to think of the design of buildings or architecture as the umbrella term, to provide a function, for example, a school, a house, or a hospital. Sculpture, on the other hand, we typically think of as being something purely visual, or to use the fancier term, aesthetic. But hopefully, from the examples we're about to look at, and those that you've just seen, you will see this link and be inspired to develop your own ideas that incorporate sculptural and architectural elements under the theme of spirals. This piece is called Tatlin's Tower. It was designed as a grand monumental building by the Russian artist and architect Vladimir Tatlin. It was never built. It was planned to be erected in St. Petersburg after the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917. It aimed to be built 400 meters high dwarfing the Eiffel Tower in Paris, and would have also included mechanics to transport people to the top. Its spiral-like form was intended to create a sense of optimism. Just like a cathedral spire towering into the sky, this continuously flowing form tapers as it goes up and gives a sense of false perspective, making it appear taller than it is. The proposal models for this architectural form have now become sculptural artworks in their own right. One of them, which can be seen here, is located at the Sculpture Trail outside the Sainsbury Centre at near the UEA Lake in Norwich. If you live nearby and can walk there from your home, it's certainly worth a look. Anthony Caro was widely regarded to be one of the greatest English sculptors of his generation. This piece is called the Tower of Discovery. The name in itself gives an indication to its purpose as a form of sculpture. It invites the audience to engage with the sculpture, walk around it and clamber inside it to explore its sculptural, material qualities and form, whilst generating a physical experience for the viewer. It creates a sense of fun and encourages inquisitive childlike behaviour, a little bit like a playground ride. Caro says about this piece, it is intended to be interacted with by the public in something that is not only aesthetic, but also to do with body language. In the making, we had to be careful that it did not become too much like architecture and not like this contorting thing where you have to find your way in and around it, exploring it. I had always thought that if you were to put a limit on sculpture, it would be that sculpture is something that you are outside of. But why? Sir David Adjaye, OBE, is an award-winning Ghanaian British architect known to infuse his artistic sensibilities and ethos for community-driven projects. This piece, which is currently in construction, is called the Mass Extinction Monitoring Observatory, or MIMO for short. It will comprise a monument to the world's extinct species and an adjacent biodiversity education centre. Conceived as a continuous spiral of stone, it will be carved with images of 860 species assessed as extinct since the dodo. The monument itself will be a growing testament and constant reminder to the fragility of life, with more stones added when species become extinct. It also has a cathedral-like quality, lit from above using natural light. As you walk up through the spiral towards the light, things will become brighter. It will give the audience a sense of hope whilst exploring this tragic loss of species through the light. 
At the top, you will be able to look out over land and sea, encouraging the audience to quietly reflect and consider our natural environment. The thick stone walls give the building a sense of permanence, reinforcing the significance of this loss of species and extinction. I love this proposed design because I think it emphasises perfectly the power to inform thought and mood that architecture and sculpture can have over the audience and its ability to inform and shape us on topics such as extinction. Your task today is to create your own architectural or sculptural design in three dimensions, utilising materials that you have at home. Hopefully, from the examples that we just looked at, you may now have a greater understanding of the blurred lines between sculpture and architecture. It is entirely up to you whether you wish to create a design that is more sculptural in its form or more architectural and functional. Do you wish for your design to have a proposed function and be able to inhabit people, or do you wish it to be something purely visual? Do you want it to be for a specific person and about a specific thing, or perhaps your creation will be purely about material and form? The scale of your design is entirely up to you. You may choose to make something small and precise or large and bold. We are looking to see your creative interpretation of this open brief. The one criteria though is that you incorporate a spiral or spirals into your design. Before we get started, let's have a little look at the equipment and techniques that you might need to use. All you're going to need today is some scissors, tape, a ruler, a pencil and some cardboard. Start by cutting up your cardboard into useful pieces. Use a ruler and a pencil or draw freehand before you make cuts to try and ensure they are accurate. Use a ruler and the edge of your scissors to score the cardboard halfway through so that you can make nice accurate fold lines. If you want to create a curve in a piece of your cardboard, I recommend pulling it over the edge of a table as it will help the cardboard to curve nice and evenly. You can even create curved joints in cardboard by marking out a line and then going over the top with your scissors and scoring it. The fewer joints you put in the model the better, so try and score as many pieces and create nets from your work and fold them up as the edges will likely be much neater than areas where you've needed to tape them together. You can also think about creating a tab to help stick things together, as shown here. Tabs are really useful. By making little incisions into a piece of cardboard and folding tabs back, it will increase the surface area and allow you to stick things down much easier. You can also use objects you have in your home. Here I'm just using a pencil to bend a piece of cardboard around to create nice flowing shapes. By using a piece of tapered card, as shown here, it's really effective at creating a nice spiral form. Don't forget other basic techniques, such as creating concertinas, or folding cardboard in half and cutting your shape out, then opening it up again to create a symmetrical shape. Finally, try and be creative with how you join your pieces of cardboard together. Often the tape and glue are going to be the messy bits, so any opportunities to create tabs or interlocking bits will really help improve how things appear. Now, to quickly recap what I've been over so far, make sure that you consider creating neat fold lines wherever possible, using tabs to help you stick things down by increasing the surface area, being creative with how you join things together to keep things neat. Scoring along paths to help folds look neat and tidy. Utilising curves by rolling things over the edge of your paper. Incorporating spirals. And finally, decorating your design so that it embraces lots of these skill sets and looks as good as possible.
It is entirely up to you on what end of the spectrum you want your design to be. Do you want it to be particularly sculptural or particularly architectural? Or maybe something in the middle? The key thing we want to see you do is to be inventive and playful with the simple material that you have got. You can work at whatever scale you want or whatever your cardboard limits allow you to. The making should take no longer than the designated lesson and homework time that you've got available. But if you would like to spend a bit more time in the evening or weekend, do feel free to. We would really like to see some beautiful photographs of your final creation. So think about having a nice clear background, maybe photographing your model against a wall or taking it from above. You could also hang up a drape or something behind it and light it nicely, as models will look most effective when they're photographed really clearly and effectively with a nice directional light on them. Be bold and creative, be playful with your design and most importantly have fun with what you do but ensure that you document things beautifully and share them with us by uploading them into the assignment that your teacher will create for you. I wish you the best of luck and look forward to seeing what you come up with.